So thank you very much for uh, for uh, giving me the chance to to speak here. Uh, can you hear me? Okay. Yes. Okay. Um, so uh, my talk is about um, a variety of uh, algorithms and methods we've been developing uh, over the past few years, and uh, you know, most originally in the context of molecular dynamics and molecular modeling, and kind of evolving towards machine learning. Uh, so this is a, a variety of projects, and obviously it's a short talk. And I think it was overly ambitious about how many things I was going to cover in this talk, as usual. Um, so what I'm going to do is uh, just give you really sort of snapshots, a little bit of uh, introduction to what we're working on. And then, of course, you can, you can read about the, the work uh, online. It's all available. Um, I've also made the slides for this presentation in a slightly longer form. Uh, with the full body of things that I might want to cover available. Um, so there's an extended version at this link here. Um, so hopefully you can see that, uh, the companion link. If you uh, go to tinyurl and this ta-mcq, you can, you can see all the slides. And so that might be helpful also because I may have to move rapidly at some point and uh, you, you might want to read something uh, more carefully. <coughs> so the I just mentioned a few people here that are involved. Frederick Haber and Zofia Tristanova were both postdocs with me, um, now moved on to, to other jobs. Um, Andrew Jones was a PhD student in physics here in Edinburgh. Shashang Shang is a, is a maths PhD student who worked with me and is now at Birmingham as a lecturer. Uh, Zhenqing Chu is a PhD student uh, in computer science who's now in, uh, in China. Uh, and um, Matthias Sox is one of my PhD students. Uh, Amos Storkey is a computer scientist here. Gabriel Stoltz, of course, everybody knows. And, um, and then Charlie Matthews was my former PhD student. I did a lot of work on molecular dynamics with. Tiffany Vlar is a current PhD student. Tim Timothée Pouchon is a postdoc uh, from Switzerland. And that's everybody, I think. Okay. Um, right, so uh, the first thing is about thermodynamic parameterization. I think actually the most important thing I can do in this talk is to uh, is to get across these ideas of uh, of thermodynamics, how we're using thermodynamics in machine learning, how we're trying to develop it as a tool, not just for say Bayesian sampling of neural networks, but for <clears throat> uh, actually training neural networks as an optimizer. And a lot of people, when I mention this, they kind of look at me blankly, like, why would you be sampling? if your goal is optimization. And of course, they have a, a reasonable point there. Uh, it seems more direct to just go towards the minimum. Uh, but we're actually using this as an optimization scheme. And there's a lot of developing uh, lore and wisdom on why you might do that. Of course, I come from working in molecular dynamics problems. It's much more natural there. The optimization and sampling problems are closely linked. Protein folding, for example, is an optimization problem if you pose it in one way, but almost everybody treats it as a sampling. So uh, the, the, the context here is deep neural networks and trying to understand how to parameterize such, uh, such beasts, you know, with many millions of parameters. Um, there, there are so many amazing successes for these models. It's kind of, you know, it's, it's like somebody just threw a bomb into science and said, okay, you know, you were working on X, but now you're gonna work on Y because it's so exciting. The kinds of things that you're able to do with these models, everybody wants to understand what's going on and apply them, you know, in a wider range of applications. So it's just, it's a very exciting area. But there are many questions about the models and about the methods that people are using. Um, in particular, the, the, the schemes that people are using, these, these uh, large neural networks, they're not always generalizable, so you can get a solution and find out that, well, it's not very useful if you make a change to your system. So if you make a change to your data set, you want to actually, uh, you know, parameterizations for these models that are going to be valid for a wide range of data that you haven't seen. And uh, so there's actually a lot of questions about how to choose parameters for these uh, so that you, you get generalizable models in the end. There's also, really fundamental problems. We developed a lot of methodology of error estimation and accuracy estimates for, uh, for the previous um, physical models 
And now we're, we're given these neural networks and people say, well, what is the error in your, your neural network solution? It's kind of actually hard to say. <laughs> And so, I mean, there's not very much good work on error estimation. There's some bounds and certain asymptotic results, but it's quite limited. Uh, and then uh, last thing is that, that a lot of the things that actually, if you read the articles in machine learning, there are some very good articles, there's some very good ideas out there, but a lot of times they're based on intuition and you know, in, in physics, we always sort of go back to some sort of statistical physics concepts or some sort of, um, you know, foundations, and we can derive these algorithms at least with a set of principles that have been developed over many years. But in machine learning, often people just kind of, they see something and they eyeball it and they kind of guess some, some formulas and write them down, and then they fiddle with them until they're actually working. And they don't actually explain what the basis is very often of these formulas. So even, I'm not talking about rigorous mathematics, I'm talking about at the level of just having a coherent explanation for why something is working well, is often lacking. So there's just huge amounts of question marks over the methodology. And it, of course, this is an opportunity for us mathematicians, because if we get involved in this work, we might be able to put things on a stronger foundation. At least we can recognize when things aren't very well, you know, uh, uh, formulated and, and what, you know, we can help to improve that, that description of the algorithm. So that's one of the things that I'm trying to do. Okay, so uh, setting here is things like this. This is a supervised learning problem. You're trying to identify, categorize the, the digits, uh, handwritten digits. Um, and there are many other applications that could be put into this form. And it, supervised learning just means I have some data set and I'm trying to learn parameters uh, to represent the data. Uh, so the, my starting point is a, is a Bayesian perspective. So uh, Thomas Bayes was an Edinburgh graduate. Uh, so we, we all uh, hear Bayesians, whether we like it or not. Um, and, uh, and so the idea here is to try to develop a model for the posterior distribution for the parameters given the observations that we have. So D1 through Dn are, are observations. We assume a prior and we assume a likelihood model, uh, which is your statistical model that's given to you. And then uh, we have, uh, you know, the, there's a natural perspective on this in terms of a loss function or objective function that you get is minus the log of the uh, posterior density um, so I think this is very natural from the point of view of molecular dynamics, because in molecular dynamics, we work with potential energy functions, and the loss is very much the same sort of animal uh, as a potential energy function. And of course, that's a starting point for thinking about this in terms of a molecular dynamics model. In practice, people typically don't try to sample the posterior density, particularly in large scale neural networks. Uh, because it's just so challenging to do so. So they say, well, let's just find the mode of that distribution. It's very natural to do that. Um, it's certainly where a lot of the action is going to happen, but it really depends on the problem, whether or not the mode is really what you're after. So uh, you're just going to maximize the posterior density or minimize the loss. Um, I like to think of all of this in a context of interpolating from you know, one extreme to another. So a uh, pure Bayesian perspective would have tau equal one in this, in this formula. Let's see, if you put tau equal one in there, you just get pi of theta, the posterior density. But you can think of letting tau range down to zero, which means a cold state in the context of physics. And, uh, and it, it, with a, a small value of tau, you're emphasizing the mode. So it's, it's like you can kind of interpolate between these two perspectives. And you can think of this as then defining a family of distributions, which you can use to explore. And actually simulated tempering algorithms use a ladder of temperatures in order to do exploration. Um, so I think that would be very useful in this context as well in machine learning. Uh, but now, in, in what I'm talking about, temp temperature is an artificial parameter. It's just some tool that's being used in order to enhance the, uh, the, the uh, study of these models. Now, the most common method for, for uh, training neural networks is what's called stochastic gradient descent. 
Um, so the idea is that you use the gradient flow on the loss function. And if you discretize that uh, using Euler's method, you get what is actually called, well, that's a gradient descent algorithm. The stochasticity comes from the fact that you, you select, you know, in computing this likelihood, you select, um, you know, a random sampling of the data and you introduce it uh, in, in, in place of the actual loss function, the gradient of the loss function. So this G tilde is an approximate gradient and it comes about by subsampling. And there are various flavors of this, of this method. So you can mini batches and so on. I typically think of mini batch gradient descent. So now we have a, a simple procedure at each step, we're going to try to choose new parameters based on the old approximate parameters. And we get it by just adding the old parameters to a step size h, or you know, a training, a learning rate h times this uh, approximate gradient. We can recompute the approximate gradient at each step. Now, the way we, we draw those, uh, those subsamples is, uh, is going to determine the properties of this gradient that we're introducing, in this approximate gradient, but we can think of it as a noisy gradient. And maybe the simplest model is just to think that it's somehow a Gaussian uh, distributed noise, um, but that might not be valid in, in, in all situations. And in fact, typically what you should think is that this gradient depends, this approximate gradient and the noise in the gradient depend on where we are. Um, so you can imagine a model like this, where I've written G tilde as G, which is the exact gradient, plus a noise, which, uh, which depends on my position. So I've, I've just uh, introduced a covariance matrix there for the, for the noise. And uh, now I have an update formula like that. Uh, so I've written out a kind of precise model for the noise, even though I don't know what sigma is. It's really actually quite difficult to get a hold of that. But I can think of this now as a discretization, and it's very natural to do that, sort of think of this in terms of SDEs. So work backwards towards the SDE. And now I have an SDE with actually, it's a bit weird because I, that's an H there that appears. So you would have square root of H that appears in your SDE, um, which is an interesting aspect. And we studied that a bit in, uh, in the context of underdance. Um, but you now have this, this family of SDEs that you're, that you're, uh, you're working with. And uh, if H goes to zero uh, slowly enough, you can imagine that this converges towards a local minimum. Um, and that you stay near a minimum if L is locally convex. So ultimately you'll get in the vicinity of the minimum, you train near the minimum. <clears throat> and, uh, and in general, <clears throat> this uh, you can think of as just an SDE, but an SDE with an unknown invariant distribution. So this is, this is a complexity really. I mean, if we don't know anything about that, all we know is that we have some distribution. And in fact, in practice, you can't really let H go to zero because you'll lose all the exploration of the of the distribution. So you end up with a fixed step size discretization of an SDE with an unknown invariant distribution. So we're trying to actually improve on this by introducing additive noise. And this idea was first proposed by uh, Welling and Tay in, uh, in 2011. At least I think this is the first reference for this in the context of machine learning. Uh, so you actually introduce an additive noise term into the, into the model that you're working with. I've written in this form with the step size incorporated, but uh, that's not the way it's usually written. Um, but this provides a way of directly controlling the SDEs. And in particular, you know, you would typically think of, of doing this um, and using this model without actually taking the step size to zero, even though the original paper mentioned that idea that you reduce step size. And uh, without really necessarily thinking of this as a dissipative system, we now have a stochastic model. And that kind of motivates, uh, you know, the, the work that we're doing a little bit, but there are many good reasons for looking at this. So there's a paper that should be coming out soon in JMLR, um, which is actually a software paper. It's about our, our toolkit for doing sampling in uh, machine learning applications. And uh, this is part of a project of the Turing Institute. So uh, here are some of the motivations you can think of for doing sampling in place of direct optimization. So using a 
an additive noise model. Uh, you can ameliorate, um, ameliorate the barriers in the training landscape and increase diffusion rates. And diffusion is a molecular dynamics concept, so like molecular diffusion. So that means kind of the variation in the parameters that you see. You can address degeneracies in the SDE model, so you can now use tools from ergodicity and hypocursivity to study these, uh, these, these methods that you're using in machine learning. You can introduce concepts from statistical mechanics that require ergodicity uh, in, in order to study algorithms and also to develop algorithms because there are formulas for things that are, that are determined in statistical mechanics context that can actually be applied to simplify the equations. There are interesting things that you can do. A virial theorem, for example. You can, uh, you can study enhanced sampling strategies. Huge amounts of stuff that have been developed over the years in molecular dynamics. Why not exploit some of that? It's actually used in molecular dynamics often for something that looks very similar to what we're doing in machine learning. For example, in, uh, in applications like protein folding, you're actually doing global optimization. Um, and uh, there's also ways to use this uh, to develop methods for Bayesian neural networks, so for tau equal one, and in which case you can do uncertainty quantification based on a Bayesian framework, which is great. I mean, if you can do it, it's obviously expensive in practice and difficult in very high dimensions, but I think there's a lot of good motivation in that. And finally, um, this provides tools for training generative models and variational autoencoders, which require actually getting a handle on a distribution function and sampling a distribution function. So there are wider applications within machine learning. So there's lots of reasons to study these kinds of models and methods. And one surprise that we found was that in some cases, the thermodynamic approaches can dramatically accelerate the convergence to near minima. And I'm gonna explain a little bit about that. Uh, so uh, one thing you can do to improve right away on what Wallin and Tay did is to look at underdamped Langevin dynamics. I think people are all familiar with this. So that's the, the more general model that we will be uh, working from. We actually work with a wider class of models than this. And uh, it has nice properties. Uh, there's a lot of things have been figured out about it. So we know how to study this model. And one of the things that we did in our work in molecular dynamics was develop very good discretization schemes for this Langevin model. So we have, I think, the state of the art for molecular dynamics uh, in, in the treatment of Langevin dynamics, things like the Bayoab method that we developed. Um, so just to show you why you might want to use underdamped as opposed to overdamped, here's a Rosenbrock banana of some sort. And uh, so this is a distribution function. This, whoops, the, the star here represents uh, the minimum. So you expect the samples to be clustered near that minimum if you're just looking for a the minimum cell, you want them to be near it. Yellow is the overdamped dynamics with the equivalent step size to what we're using here in the green model, which is the underdamped dynamics. And the underdamped is actually allowing you to more rapidly uh, reach the, the vicinity of the minimum. So there's an obvious motivation, those little simple models that you can look at. This is already showing you the idea of using low temperature dynamics, sampling dynamics, in order to find minima as an optimization scheme. Um, even with the momentum in there, even, and you know, this is actually SGDM I'm showing here. So that's, that's just actually uh, zero temperature Langevin dynamics, if you like. Um, but you know, even with this, uh, with this modification, you still get what are called locking states. And I'm not gonna actually explain what a locking state is precisely, because it's a little bit tricky. It's not exactly a local minimum necessarily, it can just be a flat place in the landscape. But at any rate, we get these locking states where we actually are stuck in training. And uh, this is actually a serious problem and we'd like to be able to avoid these. So this is a very tightly wound spiral data classification problem. You can see two colors of data points. And what we're trying to do is find a classifier that separates the two. So we're looking for a high contrast description by this uh, background field that we see here. And so one of the things we'd like to do is find faster methods. And one of the interesting things that you can see is that if you introduce temperature, you do actually find that there's a range of temperatures where the method performs better. And so that was with zero temperature. This is with a positive applied temperature. This is the additive noise model. 
And you can see that for temperatures in this intermediate regime, of course, they're small numbers, right? But that's meaningless, the scale here, right? This is just an artificial parameter. But at these low temperatures, but positive temperatures, we actually get much better training in this model. There's actually a range, like a Goldilocks zone, if you like, where the temperature is actually helping you. Now, that motivates a lot of work for us because we've done a lot of work on, on SD models and SD methods that sample uh, Gibbs distributions, that sample, uh, you know, actually general distributions, if you like, general positive densities. And uh, so these are just a range of different algorithms we've been looking at over the years to enhance sampling in various types of applications in various types of contexts. And I'm going to say a couple of words about the one at the bottom here in the middle, additive, adaptive uh, Langevin methods. Um, and uh, I won't say much about constrained Langevin on the left there, but that's, uh, that's actually in the slides that are available from this talk. So there's, I think, a, a, a good possibility to exploit ideas that have been developed over the years in molecular modeling in this, in this context. Okay, so just the last thing here, I'm going to finish up with the, talking a, a bit about these partition adaptive methods to enhance uh, training. Um, and so, so the idea here comes from the adaptive Langevin dynamics for noisy gradient systems. We do actually developed that first in 2011 in a paper with this physics PhD student. I happen to be his external examiner, his internal examiner in his PhD thesis. Um, and then we, uh, we got to talking about how we could actually introduce thermostats in systems that had noise in the model. And uh, so we applied Nose Hoover governors, okay, to these systems in order to develop a new model. And uh, then since then it got picked up in the machine learning community. And then we revisited it in that context and studied it uh, uh, some more. In fact, we published a paper in, in NIPS in 2015 on this subject. Um, so here's the model. It's called adaptive Langevin. And the idea is very simple. It's like Langevin dynamics in which you learn the friction. And you, know, you actually explicitly put in an observable, which is the kinetic energy. And you try to control the kinetic energy. And by doing that, it turns out that you can actually control the distribution. So it's kind of surprising, but it just comes about because in the distribution function, for uh, Langevin dynamics, uh, for you know Gibbs, uh, the Gibbs distribution, you actually have this product form with a Gaussian distribution. So it's really enough to control the momenta with the kinetic energy constraint in order to actually lock this distribution. That's the basic idea, and you can you know show that this is ergodic uh, as well. So the idea is you have this noise that's being introduced here. Again, I have the H dependency represent gradient noise, okay, but you more generally you would have just a, a noisy gradient there in the red box. And then you have this XC parameter, which is your friction, which is adaptively learned. And uh, so now you don't need to know in advance the friction that gives you the, 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 the target ensemble, you actually uh, just learn it on the fly. And the latest thing we've done on this is with uh, Gabriel Stoltz and Matthias Sachs. Uh, we've been studying uh, the L2 mu convergence analysis using, using these ideas from Dilbo, uh, Muho, and Schmeiser. And I mean, this is just beautiful theory. Uh, Gabriel really explained it all to us, of course, and, uh, and did the lion's share of this. But um, the idea is to um, develop, define an ent entropy functional and then uh, use an entropy argument in order to show the L2 mu hypocursivity. You also get a spectral gap, you get a central limit theorem. Uh, so the result is here. So this is the adaptive Langevin dynamics written up here in a slightly different form. Um, and uh, this is actually just appearing in SIAM Journal of Applied Mathematics. Um, so you have to assume an, a Poincaré inequality. You need some controls like this always, some, some, some regularity control. And then um, you can get these kind of uh, geometric convergence results. And uh, so, uh, that gives you, in fact, uh, using this argument from Bhattacharya, you get uh, a central limit theorem. And uh, actually, you get control of the parameters in the central limit theorem. So that's just, that's the only the math, only, the only math result in this talk is right here. Um, this is, I think, quite a nice result. Um, so I encourage people to pick up this paper and uh, send all your questions to Gabriel and Matthias. Um, so, uh, 
now, uh, what we're interested in is using these ideas in machine learning. And what we found was that if we combine this adaptive Langevin idea with, with uh, another idea about anisotropic modeling, that we could enhance the convergence dramatically. And sort of the origin of this would be in rescaling dynamics in order to get rap more rapid convergence. And we had studied that separately in this work by um, myself and Charlie Matthews and Jonathan Weir, um, who's at NYU, um, on ensemble preconditioning. Uh, so we've been looking at these methods that uh, somehow, you know, motivates a little bit thinking about ways of treating the different variables differently. And uh, this also play, plays a role in the foundation of methods like Adagrad, RMS prop, Adult, Adam, all these schemes that are being used. And you can see here, like a Newton preconditioned model, how it performs on that Rosenbrock banana. So I'm comparing white is overdamped, green is underdamped, Langevin dynamics, and black is a Newton preconditioned model. Okay, so I'm using a, a, a inverse Hessian in the model in order to accelerate the, the sampling or the convergence to the, to the minimum. Now here, that you can't really do that kind of Newton preconditioning in machine learning because the size of the matrix would be ridiculous and million by million dense matrix or something. So, you know, instead of doing that, what we're doing is actually something just uses the, the hierarchy of parameters in the model. So we actually have some, some knowledge of the parameters of the model. We use that in order to, uh, to develop this. And so we're partitioning our system and then we use it to get a partition integrator. And there's motivation for this in the literature that somehow the way the different layers are trained, you know, depends on which layer we're in. So in other words, the, the, the later layers and the early layers learn at different rates. And so there's a kind of anisotropy built into the model framework and we're going to try to exploit that. So this is the Adlala method, which combines adaptive Langevin, that's the first three equations, for the first layer, the, let's say the, it could be the first layer. In typical practice, we use it for the early layers. And then a Langevin model in the outer layer. And we have now parameters that we can use to try to control this dynamics and to enhance it. We typically use low temperatures in the output layer and a higher temperature in the hidden layer. So we're, ex we're increasing the exploration in the hidden layer and the input layer. Um, and and we're, we're freezing more rapidly in the outer layer. I mean, this is in, has incredibly dramatic effects. So this is comparing Adam, which is sort of state of the art in optimization in machine learning um, with Adlala, which is this partition scheme. And you can see here in the training and test accuracies um, that we're getting much, much higher um, accuracies and we're doing the same amount of work. So this is actually not costing anything to do this. And that you can see the results there in the classification, much better classifiers. Um, here is actually movies. Uh, hopefully you can see these. I'm just gonna fire these all off. Um, so there's the top four are SGD, Adam, Langevin, Underdamped, and Adaptive Langevin. And that's how far they get. And this is Adla, which is this partition scheme. So using the anisotropy. And we're doing exactly the same amount of work in these, in these different calculations. And Adam has been tuned to have the best possible performance for it. I'll just, uh, I have to finish up here. Um, I just show you two examples quickly with just pictures. This is poker hands, training for poker hands. And you again see on the right, the test accuracies much, much higher for Adlala than we can attain with these different schemes. And, uh, and then this is for chess end games. Yes, they're all games. Uh, we are doing other things as well, but I'm just showing you these two examples. This is predicting how many moves it will take for king and rook to checkmate king in chess. So, uh, you know, you have 16 classes for how many moves it's going to take plus one for a draw, okay? And, uh, and the, this is uh, the, uh, the, the trained model with the ad la la. Actually, it's ad la 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 because we're using several hidden layers here. Uh, so uh, we use Langevin in the outer ones and adaptive Langevin just in the first layer. And uh, you can see really dramatically improved results. So those are some examples I think that kind of hint towards uh, you know, what we're doing. And uh, I, I probably should stop here because I think we have uh, we reached the end. Um, but there is this bit on constraint-based regularization in the slides that are available from the talk.
Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Ben. So, uh, any questions for Ben? Please feel free to un unmute yourself. Uh, yes, hello, uh, Pierre Marché. Uh, thank yes. you for this uh, nice talk. Uh, I had a question regarding the adaptive um, Langevin uh, equation. So, so you learn the friction, so the scalar friction. Uh, can you, so as you said, the uh, friction is supposed to be something that depends on the parameter. So can you uh, like add uh, several parameters and have some functional form, choose some functional form of the friction and then learn each parameter? Uh, I, I know what you're saying. Um, I, I've discussed this with, with Gabriel Stoltz on several occasions. And we don't actually have a phenomenal understanding of this. Maybe Gabriel's learned more in the in the meantime. Um, I, I would be wonderful to be able to adapt that. There are some things you can write down fairly easily. Uh, for example, you could write down like a diagonal form, and you could learn uh, different parameters. Um, you can introduce some other constraints. Okay, so it's quite difficult to introduce these models, to develop these models, and make them practical. The, the one where you just have kinetic energy controls is very straightforward. You can actually introduce something that would have a kinetic energy control that would be, for example, projected, would have a position dependency in the form of that control. And it actually can be, you can build a kind of an adaptive model based on that. But so far in practice, it's been difficult to utilize these ideas. So when we've tried to write something down, it might look attractive, but nobody's actually shown that one of these would be effective. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, any uh, further questions? Uh, if not, I just have a question about uh, the uh, effect of the number of uh, epochs you are running your simulations for. So mm. it seems to be like stabilizing after a while in your case. The performance yeah. is stabilizing and it's not really data relating. You don't see the effect of overfitting. Oh, no, I mean, in, de in many models, you do see overfitting. Um, see. That's definitely, and in fact, that's one of the things, I didn't talk about it here, but that's one of the things we're trying to address in the uh, constrained regularization approaches because one aspect of overfitting is actually quite simple. If the if the weights become very large, what happens is mm -hmm. you get steeper and steeper interfaces, and that mean, may mean that you're actually, if you think about the classification problem, you're actually building a very tight interface around a data point, mm -hmm. which of course is is completely against the idea of generalizable models. So. One idea is just to control the sizes of the weights. And our constraint work is actually based on nutrition constraints on isometry, for example, in order that the weights don't grow during, during the, the training, they're actually bounded. And by doing that, by putting things in a compact manifold, you actually can control the, uh, the, 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 the stability of the classifiers that you're learning. It helps to prevent overfitting. Oh. That's actually in the most recent work that they did. So. Oh, that's very interesting. Okay, uh, thanks a lot for your very nice talk, uh, Ben.